you're aiming you're either either aiming at Christ or something lesser. Yeah. Or if things get really out of hand, you're aiming at something opposite and you don't want to be doing that. But and this is a matter of definition in some sense. And, and mm -hmm. it's actually not impossible to understand is that you aim at something better, generally speaking. I mean, maybe you're out to cause pain, but forget about that. You, you aim at something better. You wouldn't do it unless it was better. In fact, it, it virtually defines better. Like yeah. the, the whole idea of better is predicated on the idea that there's an aim that's beyond you. And then the highest of those aims is the amalgamate. The highest aim is the amalgama uh, amalgamation of all higher aims. And that's a perfect mode of being. And, and that by definition, that's a psychological perspective. Again, that by definition is Christ. So, so there you go. We're, a we're all aiming for something bigger, better, higher than ourselves. And by definition, that is Christ, right? Now, Pajot, who he's talking to, is an Eastern Orthodox pastor. So this is a very interesting back and forth. And then, but then there seems to be something too convenient about C.S. Lewis's insistence that that also has this is to manifest itself concretely in reality. So, so he says, now what C.S. Lewis said, he C.S. Lewis kind of pushes a cosmological argument for the existence of God. If the highest of all possible aims is Christ, says C.S. Lewis, what's the point of the highest of all possible aims if it never becomes real? That is essentially what Lewis says, right? Like, if it never becomes instantiated, if it never becomes real, comes into existence, says C.S. Lewis, what's the point? Okay, Peterson, you've acknowledged the highest of all possible things is Christ, but if it never actually becomes instantiated in real life, what good is it? And that is why C.S. Lewis says he believes. But Peterson says, well... That just seems too good to be true. Again, let me rewind just a sec and show you. In reality, at one point in history, and I'm not, and, and that by definition, that's a psychological perspective again, that by definition is Christ. And then, but then Listen. there seems to be something too convenient about C.S. Lewis's insistence. It's too convenient. That, that also had to manifest itself concretely in reality at one point in history. And I'm not, like, I, I, I don't understand why I should believe that. And I don't, I don't understand why. I tend not to believe things without a why. There's always a why. And, yeah. and I, there's, there's a hurdle there that I, that, that, well, that I waver on constantly. Because, I, well, I already said that you're, when you think these things through, at least my experience has been, if you think them through sufficiently, you end up with, the choice between impossible alternatives and so yeah but it eastern orthodox ogre eastern orthodox so notice peterson is wrestling with this idea of a real instantiated existing in time and space jesus he's wrestling with this idea and pajot this guy an eastern orthodox pastor is gonna push him a little bit He's like, I, I want you to wrestle more with this idea of a real, actualized, instantiated Jesus. Not just a theoretical, highest of all possible psychological aims Jesus, right? It, it has to do, one of the ways to see it maybe is, is, it has to do with the recognizing of the goodness of the world or the goodness of creation. That, that the world is capable of manifesting these patterns. Right? So if you want to understand, for example, the big conflict between the early Gnostics and the Christians, that's what it was all about. Because the Gnostics basically wanted a disincarnated Christ. They were saying, you know, and they viewed the world as utterly fallen, as having no value, having to be escaped, having to be fled in every way. Whereas Christianity posits that it's a non-dual, it's a non-dual proposition. It's saying it's, it all comes together. That's the, that's the promise. It all comes together. So what Pajot is saying is, Jordan, you're acting like a Gnostic. You want the idea of Jesus without the reality of Jesus. That's what Pajot is saying. And we as Christians are saying, we're not content with Gnosticism. 
We're not content to stop short with a idea or intellectual conception of Jesus. We want a fully real, instantiated, alive, in the flesh Jesus. That's what the Bible is asserting. And that's what Pajot is challenging Peterson with. Together. And so it has to come down, right? And so it has to come down at every level. And not only does it have to come down into the person of Christ who's incarnated, but that person has to go down, down into death to the very bottom of the world, you know, to the belly of the Leviathan, and then come back up. And so the whole world is declared as once again, is declared as ha being capable of participating the, in this good. And so, and so you could say, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't that one. Maybe it wasn't, you know, it's like, why would it be that particular, particular place where it happened? And well, it had like, to well, be that's some place. That's the story. I so this, you can see Peterson is really wrestling with the idea, right? Because Pajot says, well, somebody might argue, why would it have to be that story? Why would it have to be, have to happen? And what Peterson is saying, well, it had to happen somewhere. It had to happen sometime. He's buying into this idea that no, it ought to be real and instantiated. You're right. I buy your argument, Pajot, that it's not merely an intellectual proposition, but instead it had to be real right? It had to happen in reality. What Peterson is saying is, hey, I'm buying your argument, right? It had to be somewhere. And that's where Pajot is starting to, to push him on this idea. I mean, that's where that's the, there is no other story like that story that we have. And, and so once you recognize that this is part of the declaration that the world does embody these patterns, that it leads to this, the, 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 this, this story of, of, of a man who embodied them absolutely and is bringing us in him to also embody them in a way that will transform us. You know, like the, the, the ultimate goal of, of Orthodox vision of Christianity is, is theosis. It's to become God, to become God through, through transformation and participation in God. Don't, don't, if you're Protestant, don't let that scare you, okay? What, what he's, you know, we say the same things just in different words, right? What do we say? Well, Christ is our ultimate example and we should become like Christ. We should be conformed to the image of Christ. On and on you go. Jesus said, when you see me, you see the father. Jesus said, Philip, have I not been with you this whole time? And yet you didn't recognize me, right? It's the same thing, guys. We are to be conformed after the image of Christ, who is himself God in the flesh, right? We need to recognize that. And so please don't be put off by Pajot's language here just because he's Eastern Orthodox, okay? Don't, don't be put off by that. Ogre says, I feel Peterson in some weird way is already so powerful in the ways of God that if he gave his life to Christ, he'd be such a great witness. I agree 100%, Ogre. And here's the deal too. I don't think he's a bad witness now. Honestly, look at how powerfully his concepts and ideas have been for the church. Look at how people are being drawn to Christianity. P people are flocking to the Bible and Bible stories because of Peterson's interpretation and understandings of them. And we could argue over the theological minutia, right? But the fact of the matter is that he is wrestling and grappling with God in a real way that the vast majority of people don't even attempt, right? Now, now, listen, there's a reason I'm playing this section of the interview, because Pajot and Peterson are talking in depth about this idea. So that's the final goal of everything, is to become participant in the, the divine. And how do, you, how do you distinguish that from Catholicism? No, I, I mean, in terms of that, I think that it's a difference of emphasis. I think, for sure, the Orthodox emphasize theosis more than the, than the Catholics. The Catholics are, are kind of iffy about theosis in terms of it's there in some of the thinkers, but it, I would say it's probably not official Catholic doctrine, but I think without theosis, you're missing the point of the whole thing, right? You're missing the point of, of everything. Like why, why do things exist, right? Like wh why do things exist? And so I think that the idea that they exist to participate fully in their most perfect form, like that's what they're called to, 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 to part, to, to do, you know, and, and it ends up being a declaration of the ultimate possibility for goodness in the world. I think that that's, yeah. Well, it, listen, 
it seems it seemed to me I've observed let's say that it's possible to it isn't obvious to me that anyone wants to leave live a meaningless existence I don't think you can live a meaningless existence without becoming corrupted because the pain of existence will corrupt you without a, a, a saving meaning and it also seems to me that you can sell the story that meaning is to be found in responsibility. When I've tried to sell that story to myself, I seem to buy it. And when I've tried to communicate it with other people, it renders them silent, large crowds of people silent. And that's strange because I, I'm not sure why that is. It, it, it's perhaps because the connection between responsibility and meaning had never been made for in, in that explicitly somehow because meaning gets contaminated with happiness or, or something like that, but it's to be found in responsibility. And then you could say, well, there isn't any, any responsibility that's more compelling than trying to aid things in the manifestation of their divine form. That should be an adventure that could be sold. And I don't know why the church can't do it. Oh, man. Oh, man. Come on. Come on. He's right about that. I'll tell you that much, guys. Why can't the church sell the gospel? Why can't the church make a compelling case that people are passionate to follow? You know, say what you want about Jordan Peterson, right? But he sees the vision, and what he doesn't understand is why on earth he can pack stadiums to tell people about the Bible from a psychological perspective, and yet churches are dying across the world. We as the church should take this statement here to heart and ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? Okay, we need to do that. The church needs to do a little self-reflection at this point. All right? We need to do a little self-reflection at this point. Why can't the church sell the message? We have the most powerful message to sell. And we can't seem to sell it. What is going on here? Right? When I heard that, man, that's repenting in dust and ashes. I would tear my garment, but I like it too much. Is that, is that materialism? <laughs> Dust and ashes, guys. Man, how right is he? Church is dying across the world. We have the most compelling story in the entire existence of the world. And we, we, can't, we can't get anyone to show up to church. It's crazy. It's crazy. So we need to hear that. But he, he goes further. He goes further. I, it's in this sense, guys, Jordan Peterson is so prophetic, right? Like, again, say what you want about does he believe, does he not believe, you know, all this type of stuff. Just table those things and ask yourself functionally, what purpose is he serving in society right now? He's challenging the church. I love it. We need to be challenged. Unbelievers and atheists are second guessing and questioning themselves. Maybe there's more to the Bible than I thought. Maybe I need to read more and think about it more. Maybe I need to explore faith. I saw somebody doing an interview with somebody and they literally said, this is no joke. They said, well, I would consider myself to be an atheist, but then I watched Jordan Peterson and I consider myself now to be a Christian atheist. And he goes, I don't even know what that is, but that's what I would consider myself to be. I don't know about you, but I see that as good. <laughs> okay. Like that's a step in the right direction. We can work through, you know, all the details at a later date, fine. But if somebody goes, man, I, I thought I was an atheist, but maybe I'm a Christian atheist instead. We're making progress. <laughs> We're making progress. So say what you want about him, but he's so prophetic. He's causing a wave of people being more interested in Christianity than ever before. It's powerful, guys. It's powerful. So we need to think about that. We need to think about that.
I, I think you're right, Zimmy. I think you're right about some of that. See, there you go. Look at Absolution, guys. Awesome, Absolution. I appreciate your feedback there. Jordan Peterson helped me to get through suicidal thoughts, helped me to find my faith. Look at that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Praise God. I like that, Ambassador. I like that. So, yeah, hear what he has to say. And again, he's been talking with Pajot and wrestling with this, does Christ really exist? Did he really instantiate? Did Christ really take on flesh and dwell among us, die on a cross for our sins, and then resurrect from the dead? Did that really happen? I don't understand that. And, and because it seems to me that that's something that I've done, at least in part. And that accounts for the strange popularity of the biblical lectures in particular. Yeah. And, but I've also, and I, I do believe that, I do believe that, that the right striving is to attempt with all your heart to encourage things to develop along that, towards that divine goal like what else would you possibly do once you think that through it's like hmm. you're always aiming at something that's better or you wouldn't be aiming you're always moving towards something that's better or you wouldn't be moving so then why wouldn't you move towards the greatest good yeah well it's because it's terrifying i suppose in part but then as you know i've tried to put that into practice in my life and it's tearing me into pieces I don't know, though, if this goes back to my talk earlier, guys. Discipleship is three things at once, guys. Discipleship is belief, affection, and action. Belief, affection, and action. It seems to me that Jordan Peterson has the affection and the action parts down. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that Peterson has got his affections correct. He's feeling the right things about how he should feel, and he's got his actions correct. I need to move towards the divine. I need to try and move towards something that's greater than myself, etc. He's got those in place. What, what's he wrestling with? He's wrestling with the belief part. The Jesus was truly incarnate, took on flesh, dwelt among us hung on the cross for our sins, died, and truly resurrected from the dead. That's the part he's wrestling with. The belief part. But again, guys, that's only one part of discipleship. Jordan Peterson, it seems to me, is outpacing many Christians when it comes to affections and actions. And oftentimes, if you work on two of the three areas of discipleship, the third area catches up. He's trying to get there on the belief. His actions are solid. His affections are solid. And he's working on the belief part. I see nothing but good in that trajectory, guys. That's got me excited, right? That's got me learning, growing, developing, right? But guys, it's, it's like, you know, Christianity is a process, guys. Belief and faith is something that takes time. We have to wrestle with things. Back and forth, God is working with us. And Jordan is, is he's living this out in public, right? And it seems to me he's doing an admirable job of exploring Christianity in public. At least much more admirable than many others I've seen. How many pop stars in the recent past have we seen come out and say, I'm a Christian now. And it's like, oh boy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm not naming any names or anything like that. But that happens. That happens. And I think Peterson is wrestling with belief in Christ in a very admirable way. And listen to where he goes. Listen to where he goes with this. There's a reason I'm showing it. If one of the reasons is because you're also alone. And I, you know, I, because you, I mean, at least to my understanding, you're not in a, in a, in a community. Um, well, it's you, hard to say. I mean, it's hard to say. Because fans aren't I a certainly community. haven't last. Well, they've been a community. I mean, yeah. one of the things that has held me together, certainly, is... He's trying to push him. Pajot's doing a good job, man. Hey. Hey, Jordan. In the church, we explore these ideas together, and you have support from others. <laughs> Pajot's doing so good, man. The commitment that I feel to... to the people who've been so 
positive towards me and my family. Mm. I do feel that as a community. I understand what you mean. Why the hell not go to church? <laughs> you know, I know you're wasn't going to come right out and say it, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you're not that blunt about it. But it's not just you know it's it's not just about going to church. I one time I I told you something and and I don't know if I could drive if I was able to drive it through. There there's something about being in a hierarchy that is that because there's an aspect of being in a hierarchy that you talk about which is this kind of striving to to kind of be the best within that hierarchy but there's an aspect of being in a hierarchy which is that the hierarchy covers you oh definitely there's no and, doubt about that yeah and mm. so there's something about submitting. that's why the lowest mem the, the lowest status members of a chimp group will still fight off interlopers yeah and so there's there's a value in being in a community and a and a hierarchy where you, like I go to confession, right? I, I go to confession, I go to my priest and I confess my sins and and I give that to him. He actually takes responsibility for for an aspect of listening to my sins and, and kind of participating in my salvation. And he, and so the weight ends up being distributed across the community. Again, again guys, don't let his, his Eastern, Eastern Orthodox language put you off. Okay. Try to try to don't have a trigger word. You know, we have trigger words in our mind, theological trigger words. Don't use a trigger word. Instead, try to think what's the concept he's trying to communicate here. Right. And he's trying to communicate the concept of having a community of other believers to come alongside you, pray for you, help you, guide you, direct you. It, it, yeah, exactly. G funk. You got it. Unity. It's not, so you don't actually just bear it on your, on yourself. And it's not just even that, and it's not just a living community. It's a, it's not just those that are alive in the, in the hierarchy, but those that are, that have left their story. All the saints are part of this hierarchy that you engage in, that you participate in, and that you see as consolation, as examples, as, you know, as examples of people who have lived through difficult things that you can kind of, uh, that you can shoulder up against, you know? And so that's one of the reasons why I, I kind of insist with, at least for the people that watch my videos is, is it, when I say go to church, it's not just because I trying to moralize you into doing something. It's because it's a, it's actually a participation in how the best vision of reality works. So Jordan, you like the idea of Christ. He's already made the argument that Christ has been instantiated, right? He's already made that argument. And now what he's trying to say is the church is the living and fleshing out of the Christ idea that you like. And of course, that's biblical, right? Jesus reconciled us to God and then entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, so we're supposed to now live in that Christ-like manner. I've got no objection to any of that. <laughs> But I've no seen you, I've seen you, objection. I'm probably one of the only people in the world that has actually seen you in church and seen you, yeah, you and how'd that squirm go? and yeah. squirm in church. How'd that go? Why? See, the other thing, I was reading, again, I was reading this book and it's been mostly a jumping off place for me to think. It's like, there's also something because I'm not inside the church, so to speak, it's hard to say what the utility of that is. The utility of being inside the church. Of being outside it. Oh, being Because outside I'm an outsider church. talking about religious matters. Yeah, but I think... So, some have termed... Some have termed Jordan Peterson as the... I, I don't know how to put it, the unapproved evangelist, right? Because he's outside the church. I, I forget what passage it is. Somebody maybe can tell me the passage in the book of Acts. But remember, the disciples are preaching and teaching, and they run across somebody else who's preaching and teaching as well. And they're like, should we tell them to stop? And they're like, no, just let them, just let them go on. Just let them continue. Or it might be in the Gospels. But, it, but it's kind of interesting, right? Because Jordan Peterson fulfills a similar role, where he's not affiliated with the church, but he's calling people back to the Bible in his own unique way of doing it. And that's kind of grabbing people's interests, right? That's kind of grabbing people's interests. I think that I think that, I think that it has played a great role. Like I, I've often said something that I've often- There we go, Mark 9, 38 to 41. 
John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to prevent him because he was not following us. Uh, guys, is that not Jordan Peterson? Come on. Guys, we saw Jordan Peterson casting out demons in our society in your name, in the name of Jesus, but he's not a Christian, or at least he doesn't check all of our Christian boxes, so we tried to prevent him. What did Jesus say? Do not hinder him. There is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able to afterwards speak evil of me. He who is not against us is for us. And whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly, I will say to you, he will not lose his reward. Very interesting. Very interesting. Just look at the parallels, guys. Very interesting parallels. I often said that you're something like King Cyrus. If you know the story of King Cyrus, in scripture, King Cyrus was a Persian king uh, who told the Jews to go back to Israel and build their temple. So he wasn't Jewish. Like he wasn't, he wasn't an Israelite. He wouldn't believe in the God of the Israelites. But he was like, hey, you know, that temple of yours looks pretty nice. Why don't you just go back there and, and rebuild your own, own thing? And so that's definitely an effect that I've seen you have. You know, the number of people that have, become Christian because of you is hilarious. Sorry, it's not hilarious, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of this strange thing because you, you, you kind of stand outside and you look at, you're looking at the door and you're looking at the church and you're saying, Hey, this isn't not so bad. You know, look at this. What is, what is going on here? Like, what is this about? And, and then because of that, no, it's also, of... do you think you've got something better? <laughs> you know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day when we were walking, because as I said, I walk about 10 miles a day right now try to keep myself under control. And, you know, he, he was raised a communist in Poland and, and, is, and then an atheist. And he was complaining, I think, I think this is what he told me, that he was complaining to his parents at one point about a religious wedding that they were going to, despite not believing. And he mm. said, as he got older, he realized he had nothing to replace that with. It's like, okay, throw it out. Fine. Okay. Now, where are you? Well, you're just as bad off as you were before, but you also don't have that beautiful thing. Yeah. It's like, what would happen if we dispensed with Christmas? Well, if it's We'd logical. It's a good thing to ask way to Sam Harris shopping. and That's the new it. atheists. Let's, let's get rid of Christmas. Or we, or we could say we could make it entirely secular, but then it would just disappear. But you know, that's not what's going to happen because religion is inevitable and we're seeing it coming back in very strange ways. It's going to be a weird, woke, uh, identitarian religion, which is, which is going to come back. That's why Pajot points out the fact that when you dispense with religion, you end up worshiping something somewhere else. We are made as worshiping creatures. You can't escape the religious impulse. The question isn't whether or not you will worship. The question is what you will worship. That's your only choice. You don't have a choice as a created human being whether or not to worship. You're going to worship. You're created that way. And what Pajot was pointing out is if you choose not to worship God, you're going to worship something else. And it manifests itself in weird ways, and that's what he's getting at. If you get rid of Christmas, you're going to replace it with something, something religious, something that looks like worship, but it just might not be the kind that you would expect. And New primitive, atheist. you know, it, it, part yeah. of it's part of it's going to be Tribalist. intent doesn't matter. Yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah. So it's a it's a scary thing. Like that's what, you could say that that's one of the failures of the new atheists is that they led to the well, they partly led to the new woke uh, phenomena because they they didn't realize that you can't get rid of religion. You can't get rid of rich. That's a good you can't point, Angie. The problems and opportunities of identity, all of these things are going to come back. Yeah, that's a really good point, just, Angie. You try to brush them aside, then they're going to come back in varied weird ways. And without you realizing what's going on, you'll have people kneeling to a shrine of a man who was killed by police and putting a halo on his head and, you know, and self mortifying themselves and doing all kinds of insane things or that look to you insane, but that you need to understand it's just, it's just this religious impulse gone gone off the rails so yes and then the question is what's the right place for it that's right you know i've it, i've i've thought in my i suppose it's a form of comedy that catholicism Hello, is as sane as people get <laughs> you know it's baroque right and and, and go, it's gothic not baroque it's gothic it's dark it's 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 it, it has the same 
aesthetic in some sense as a horror film. And I'm not being, I'm not being, I'm not saying something denigrating by that. It, I mean, it's part of its strange mystery. And all that strangeness is necessary because people would be much more insane without it than they are with it. Hmm. And it's a container yeah. for that religious impulse. And that impulse is to the, to the good. Yeah. And, it, and, and the image of the, of the crucified Christ and also the act of communion gathers in all the extremes together, right? It's like, if you think of the symbolism of we'll communion, see you you'll notice Take that care. it gathers in every extreme from the highest to the most uh, transgressive, all of it comes together. That's well, worth unpacking in, that. It's yeah. ritual cannibalism in the service of God. Yeah. Yeah, and it, but it's also it's also seen as a as a normal like meal. Oh, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're finding it interesting, Marin. I, I'm glad you're finding it interesting. I uh, I am fascinated with how society and culture is reacting to this man. I, I know I got off on a bit of a tangent, guys, but somebody kind of brought up I don't know who it was, but somebody kind of brought up Jordan Peterson and kind of talking about where he's at. And I'm extremely optimistic. That's me. You know, I'm extremely optimistic, you know. It's a journey, guys. We're all in different... And I, you know, when you consider the threefold aspect of discipleship in general, I mean, Jordan Peterson in many ways is much further along than many of us, right? So I, I'm optimistic. Who knows how it's going to go? If anything, guys, I'm very pleased with how culture and society is responding to him, you know? That's awesome, just in and of itself. And, and this is something, guys, let, let me talk about roughly speaking, what has kind of happened in society, right? What does affection and action look like in the threefold? I'll, I'll give an example, okay? Affection looks like loving the things that God loves and hating the things that God hates. That's what affection looks like, Genie. So, to have the right affections, I, I love truth and hate falsehood. Well, look at Jordan Peterson. That, that's been so much of his enterprise to tell people one of his rules i think it's rule eight or something in 12 rules for life is tell the truth or at least don't lie right i i mean that's christian okay god is a god of truth i love truth and i hate falsehood that is having the proper affection okay that's having the proper affection loving the things god loves hating the things god hates the proper action is to live in alignment with those affections Okay, so you might say to yourself, as a Christian, I want to pray and read my Bible. But if you don't ever do that, your actions aren't lining up. You have the right affections, right? You desire to pray and read your Bible, but you're not actually living that out in your life. Well, implementing Peterson's 12 Rules for Life looks a lot like ordering and structuring your life in terms of your actions after what God would have you to do. So that's what affections and actions are in practice. And like I said, it seems to me that Peterson's affections and actions are basically where they should be. He just needs his belief to catch up. That, that's, that's all seems to me he's struggling with, right? And it's because he takes it seriously. He understands the consequences of belief in Christ. He recognizes what that costs, not in the public sphere in terms of clout or influence, but in his own heart and life. He understands what that means for him. And so that's why he's wrestling with it so much. That's why he's taking it so seriously. That's why he's spending his time focusing on it and not answering it in a flippant, offhanded manner. But he actually is trying to fully embrace the, the walk. Now, now here, I, I want you guys to understand the framework. Why, why is jo Jordan Peterson so effective right now in culture and society? We've gone through a process, okay, as the church. We've gone through a process. Church was ascendant, reformation hits, and enlightenment hits. With the enlightenment hits, hits these two ideas, okay? These two ideas come with the enlightenment. Rationalism, we can think our way to truth without God. And empiricism, we can test our way to truth without God, okay? So with the enlightenment comes rationalism and empiricism. We can think our way to truth without God. We can test our way to truth without God. What comes after rationalism and empiricism? Postmodernism. 
Postmodernism says you have some base assumptions that you're not granting in your pursuit of rationalism and empiricism. And so you can't know any truth. You can't embrace any truth. And postmodernism comes with a brutal critique of rationalism and empiricism. This is why many of the new atheists are outmoded. They haven't dealt well with the criticisms that have been leveled at them from postmodernism. If you find one of these new atheist types that are so focused on all we need are our senses, blah, blah, blah. Sam Harris is a type of this. Honestly, they haven't philosophically dealt with the blow that postmodernism dealt them. They are just ignoring postmodernists, and you can't. You can't ignore postmodernists. But postmodernists end up with a self-defeating critique. What is the postmodernist critique? There's no such thing as absolute truth. You rationalists, you empiricist, there's no such thing as absolute truth. And what is the simple critique for the postmodernist? Is that absolutely true? You see, postmodernists come up with a solvent, if you will, that dissolves everything, themselves included. And you're left with nothing, right? So that is the situation into which Jordan Peterson steps. That is the philosophical worldview into which Jordan Peterson steps. A world that has been shaped by a post-Christian society fueled by rationalism and empiricism that has fallen apart due to postmodernism. And he steps into that society. And what does he say? Guys, he doesn't say, oh, we can prove Christianity is true empirically. He doesn't say we can prove Christianity is true rationally. What does he say? He says, look at the story of Christianity. It works. It's right. It's moral. And that resonates with people. People go, oh, so you're not telling me to think about it. You're not telling me to mentally assent to it. You're telling me to consider its utility. You're telling me to ask myself, does it work? You're telling me to ask myself, is the moral life that it portrays right? And my soul resonates with that. And Jordan Peterson says, yes. He says, I don't, I want you to stop thinking about it. I want you to start feeling about it. I want you to stop rationalizing it. I want you to emote with it. Does Christianity feel true? Does Christianity seem true? And people are like, well, yeah, right? When I look at Christianity and what it promotes, it feels true. It seems true. It's a shame that in postmodern circles, we can't find any truth. And Jordan Peterson says, that's where you're wrong. That's where you're wrong. And he's pointing to the value of story and narrative in our hearts and in our lives and how those things shape and mold us and how they've shaped and molded our society. It's an entirely different way of thinking about the faith. And that's what's so intriguing about it because not only is it an entirely different way of thinking about the faith, but it's an entirely different way of thinking about the faith that actually fits itself into our cultural moment. We have a cultural moment right now where people are tired of arguments for the existence of God. People are tired for ra of rationalism and empiricism. And people recognize that postmodernism just leads to nihilism and fatalism. And so people are hungry for something that doesn't speak to them in those terms. And Jordan Peterson comes along and starts speaking in exactly the terms we're hungry for. And people are eating it up. It's very interesting, guys very interesting. What does this say about our churches? What does this say about our form of Christianity? What does this say about how Christianity takes so long to catch up to where the culture is at and what's needed? I think it speaks some powerful truths into our churches and we'd better listen lest we find ourselves dead here in 10 to 20 years. We're in an information rich age coming out of postmodernism where people are hungry for experiential truth. Let's stop giving people theological information for the brain and let's start giving people experiential lived Christianity for the life. And I think people will eat it up. So 
These are some of the ways I, th I think we should think about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. It's amazing. It's amazing to see what's happening. It's amazing to see what he's doing. It's amazing to see how people are responding. And I think the church can learn a thing or two. People are coming to Christianity in droves over this stuff. And they kind of don't even know why. And the sad part is they're getting compelled by a felt religious experience that they want to be a part of and then they show up in our churches where we over intellectualize everything man man how many people interested in christianity by jordan peterson will go to one of their local churches and find it to be completely lacking in terms of what they need in their life i don't know i don't know things to think about things to think about Thank you so much for watching that video all the way to the end. It really helps out this channel. I hope it provided some value to you. Other ways you can support what we do here is to click the subscribe button below or hit the notification button. If you want to support us financially, you can do so by finding our link to our Patreon in the description below. Every dollar goes towards helping grow this ministry and is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting us in any way that you can. Take care. God bless. Bye now.